is buffering. Rightio, welcome everybody. I'll um, declare the meeting open um, for the 27th of July 2022 meeting of Buller District Council. Um, we have um, some speakers for public forum and a presentation from uh, Shane Tehara Bar. So the first public forum speaker is Terry Sumner to speak on Palmerston Street safety. So Terry, you have five minutes. So yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, safety on Palmerston Street. Firstly though, I'd like to recognize that most of you will not be back here after October the 8th. And I regret that, because I think you've been a good counselor, you've done a good job. Um, and you've been handed challenges that no other council has been handed or ever faced before. And I know some people have been unkind and some have even been cruel to you. Because quite rightly, they're actually scared. They're actually panicking because we've all had a glimpse of the future. Nevertheless, I still like to make this presentation. So exhibit A is a moon block <laughs> wrapped around the spiral fracture of the tibia. Would you like to see Terry? No, no, that's fine. <laughs> Fortunately, no damage to the knee or the ankle. And this didn't happen on Palmerston Street. It was on Gorm Street, where it's crossed by Russell Street. But it could have happened on Palmer Street, where I think the risks are much higher and most cyclists avoid. I find it ironic, perhaps inevitable, but definitely unacceptable, that the vehicle that can save the world, the humble bicycle, should be discouraged and even destroyed by the vehicle that is quite literally destroying the world. Let's not pussyfoot around here. The private car is taking a toll every year of death and injury and killing the planet as well. Almost half of any New Zealand CO2 emissions are caused by transport, and the private car contributes a significant proportion of that. That popular top-selling Ford Ranger is actually a lethal weapon, a killer. I tend to be rather contemptuous of the concept of the road to zero campaign, though I do like the advert, I'll take the little one which does rather hit the nail on the head. I think the campaign, though worthy, puts the blame in the wrong place. It's not just the driver at fault, it's also the vehicle. Unfortunately, we have been sold a pig, no offence to our four-footed friends, and brainwashed into believing there's no alternative. A pig, though, is still a pig, no matter how it is decorated, with cruise control, cell parking and ABS, or an electric engine. There are still harmful emissions, if not from the fuel, then from the tyres and brake linings. There are the incredible energy costs of manufacture, said in the case of a fossil fuel car, to equal all the energy costs of its total working life. And then, of course, there are the costs of its disposal when it's time for a new one. On that day on Broad Street when I was hit, I wasn't the only victim. There was also the driver and the kids in the car. And in the long run, I am probably better, the better off. I didn't have to suffer the trauma of making a mistake and as a result, severely injuring another person. However, back to the immediate point at hand, Exhibit B, which is an advert which you will all recognise. I thought I'd cut a couple out just in case you don't recognise it from here. And it's this one. Let's shot bull, which is a great idea, but I can't see any people in that picture. Can anyone else see a picture? Person in that picture? I don't think there is one. There are a few cars, but not people. And Palmer Street. Palmer Street. 
advantage. Sorry? We're in the process of really getting the advantage. Oh, good on you, Ray. Good on you. <laughs> Put some people in. Um, and it's actually now worse on Palmerston Street than it was when that photo was taken. There's been an influx since then of house price refugees and trade is fixing flood damaged homes. It looks like Palmer Street has become a car park. And is that what we really want? And that, finally, brings me to the incident which triggered this presentation. Being disabled obviously sensitizes you to the problems of disability. And one day, a month or so ago, I had just double crutched out of a local cafe and was facing the prospect of crossing the road to reach my partner's car. Yes, the wonderful irony of being transmuted from independent cyclist to car, de to car dependent passenger. As I leaned there, an older lady emerged from the cafe, looked at me and said, I don't like crossing the road. And I thought that was just wrong. It was just totally unacceptable. So I hitched, I hatched a simple, cheap plan. The perfect solution is obviously a traffic free zone, which is what former Mayor Gary Howard was edging towards. But at the time it was like rent reform. It was a step too far. Now, what about two or possibly three speed bumps? One outside Gibby's Cafe, one outside these council chambers, and possibly one in the middle. There would then be a block of very calm traffic. Cars would still be able to enter and still be able to park, but speeds would be slow, as they are supposed to be anyway. The speed bumps would simply enforce the slow speeds at all times and make the block that much more pedestrian and cycle, scooter, and skateboard friendly, swinging the balance towards people and away from cars. Nelson and Richmond have achieved this result by using elevated pedestrian crossings, which though more attractive, take longer to install and are obviously much more expensive. With two or three speed bumps, maybe my partner, but she denied this, would feel comfortable riding our tandem down the main street. She said she would never ride the tandem down the main street. And that older lady might just be confident crossing the street to the other side. If we can't get rid of the beast, let's at least tame it. Thank you. That's Mr. Sumner. Questions, councillors? Councillor Hawes? Yeah, two or three here, right? So that and perhaps, I mean, Grey Mount is, is um, implemented 30k an hour through their central business district. Is that another option? Like, you really, you really are looking at getting speeds down, aren't you? This was at 20k. That's 20k. That so was 20k. You did that. Yeah. And if there'd been bull bars on the front, I would hate to think what, what would happen. Um, I think actually it's got to be less than, than 30, actually. I think it's got to be, someone once suggested in a book called Tools for Conviviality about 50 years ago, that the speed of a car in a town should be no faster than the speed of a bicycle. So whatever that is, 15, okay, something like that. Yeah. Um, having been in a town like that, it is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right, our next speaker is Mr. Kevin Lane. I understand you have a petition to present. Yes, yes. I've yep. got a petition here from 52 people. Um, so just to reject Palms Creek uh, Waters project. So just to, um, just to, for councillors' benefit, petitions um, uh, ordinarily should be presented to council, to the chief executive, five days prior to today. Uh, Mr. Lane had indicated he was going to do that, so it's sort of been a bit of to and fro. Um, it hasn't been done in five days, but it's been flagged some time out. So we'll accept the petition. 
um, and acknowledge you haven't had a chance to read it at all yet. So um, you're free to speak to it. Thanks. So uh, first of all, thank you uh, everybody for allowing me time to um, express our long-term proposal and funding concerns about the YMAP Rail Quarters upgrade. I'm here today to ask Council for some relief for the last 12 years of often dirty drinking water in our community pipelines. We submit a long-term proposal that will improve our water quality immensely and provide 10 days of water storage capacity. Most weather events don't last that long, so this will make a huge improvement over what we currently have. We will be able to catch and use water when it is clean and clear, and use our water storage when it is not. We suggest placing 20 30,000 litre water tanks on council land at the top end of Velvet Street. This location has power and the main water pipe passing by and is a safe place far away from the risk of flooding and related damage. A new petition that I've presented here today has twice as many votes against that voted for two years ago when we had, uh, when it was called for. Uh, and we don't agree that Cons Creek is the right direction for our future water source. So we were asking for a pause on spending in the Cons Creek intake area and pipeline until Three Waters takes control. We do, however, need to rebuild the settling tanks, which are in imminent danger of collapse at this time. We also ask that we can divert just 11% of the funding for Cons Creek up intake upgrade to pay the 80 to 100k uh, for our long-term storage proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So just for the benefit of councillors, the petition doesn't have any of that other detail attached. So the petition simply states, just spell out to council, we the community of Wailangaroa do not want the concrete project to go ahead. Yes. So that's not quite what you're suggesting in your dialogue just now. Well, you could interpret it that way, I guess. You could also see it as what it is pretty much, which is, we don't want spending to go ahead because we don't believe that that's the right way for us. Then we don't think that that's where we uh, should be going with that, with the Cons Creek, um, because it's so risk adverse and there's so much damage done continually. And we uh, and I don't think it's the scope of this discussion to have what alternatives there are at this stage. Um, that's for another time. Okay. Questions. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. But thanks, Mr. Lane. I just want to get a clear picture of when you say there are 50 signatures on there. You indicate that's twice as many as compared to those who are in favour of proceeding with the Connors Creek option. I've been on council nine years and we've consulted on many occasions with the community out there. Um, and we've had lots of different iterations of. Um, People, groups claiming to represent the community, mm -hmm. I need to get a really clear steer of who these 50 people are by comparison to those that favoured the, the proposal that's currently on the table. Um, what, how many of the rate part, how many of the suppliers they make up, or are they multiple signatures from one of our souls? Yes, some of them. So, are you so, able to, so was some of the other submissions yeah. so that we put to council last time. So, yeah, so are you able to clarify for me the number of people who have signed this that would be considered as on that supply versus the total number that are on the supply for me? Well, I can tell you that some of the people that signed that petition signed for it in the first place and now are against it. So, I can tell you about that. There's nothing else we need to say. Yeah. I've, I've got, um, in the time that I've had, I've gone round to as many people as I've had time to go round to and, and ask their opinion. And there you have it. Those people are the ones who are deciding that they no longer think that Cons Creek is a viable option for our water source. Thank you. That's laws. <laughs> yeah, well, this is kind of all the makes it um, pretty uh, to council. I mean, I know I've been in your position before I was ever on council mm -hmm. um, on some issues, and so you know, good on you for, for a while taking up that country. I mean, the discussion around just to put your where I'm coming from a question the um, discussion around the Commons Creek sort of to and fro between several different options. And as I remember it, I think um, 
probably one of the triggers was chlorination, the belief that chlorination would come into it with wistful water if that carried on the pipeline on the end. Um, and that was one of the driving forces back then. But yeah. it, are you aware now that, that, that probably in all likelihood, almost all water supplies are going to require residual formation? That was my question. Are the people of Waimangara now aware that that is, is coming to a place near you? Yes, they do. I've made sure that they are aware of that on Facebook at the death. I've given it absolute treatment that it deserves. I think um, two years ago that people were um, misinformed about that particular th thing. And, um, yeah, I think there's a lot more people now are informed in our community that that will be the case for whatever the water source we get. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Roach. Thank you, how are you? Um, just my question is around the, the, those that have signed the petition. Uh, mm -hmm. would you, could you say that everyone that signed uh, on the water supply? Uh, yes, absolutely. <coughs> Well, I uh, know, oh actually, no, let me, sorry, let me rephrase that. They will all be affected by the decisions made today or, or, or about this conversation. They will be affected. All of them. They're affected parties, is what you're saying. Sorry. Affected parties. Yes. Does that answer your question? But not necessarily currently hooked to the water supply. No, but they will be when the new laws come into place and they will have to then either look at installing water tanks themselves if they don't want to dose it and put it through a treatment of their own. And I'm talking about farmers mostly here. Um, so they will be affected because their decisions will, about how much it's going to cost for them or whether they decide to hook their farm workers up to the town supply, um, not for farming purposes, obviously only for individual purposes. So that's where the grey areas here that, that I think people try to lead to. Yeah, can I understand that a little bit more? So, in taking into account what you've just explained, and I understand what you're saying, of the 52 that are on there, how many do you know that are currently on the supply? So, are currently on the supply now as it stands. No, I couldn't give you that figure. I, I would say it may be reduced by 10. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Bowden. Thank you. So, given uh, just a question of the 52, are they 52 residents or 52 uh, water rate payers? No, these are 52 residents. Everybody will be affected by this. No, I understand that. So, this is 52, it's 200 odd connections here? No, there's 140, well, 139. 139. Yeah. So, how many of those 50, if you were going down to um, water pay, water rate payers, and you said there were about 10 off it. So yep. what percentage then would be, you know, husband and wife or families or whatever? How many individual water connections are there in that 52? I don't know. I don't know that figure. I'd have to go through and check them out. 20? I would think there'd be more than that. Quite considerably more than that. Can I ask something? So, um, I might be a bit dim here, but did you say that you don't want any water to come from Cons Creek? No, I didn't say that at all. Oh. So is the water in your proposal in due course for the water still to come from Cons Creek? Yes, currently. But okay. just not? Well, what we're actually asking for is waiting until free waters can make their decision because they're going to have some specialists in there and, and have a much bigger global sort of look at all of this where it affects aggregation all over this area. And uh, we think that they possibly will have a, um, what we're trying to avoid is basically spending money in infrastructure in Conns Creek, which can't be recovered. And if we start down there, I'm concerned and we're concerned that they will keep going down there trying to fix this thing. It's never fixable, it's just not fixable. If you've seen what the damage has done every time we have a storm, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I worked up there for seven years. I'm well aware of this area very, very well. And we just keep on having continual damages. And since I've been there for the last 30 years, we've had two complete uh, annihilations of the Cons Creek intake section itself on the Cons Creek, not on the known end Creek because there are two, two sections up there. That's an awesome. We'll wrap it up. I'll just add a little um, single 
So many people are busy trying to find better ways of doing things that should not have been done at all. There is no progress in, in merely finding a better way to do, do a useless thing. Is that what you're saying? That was Henry Ford back in the day. I didn't say that. It's going down a path that, that you can't back out of. That's well, what you're well, I'm no, I'm suggesting that we don't spend any more money in no. uh, an infrastructure that's unrecoverable down at Collins Creek because personally I don't think that is a way forward. And, and a number of the community feel that way as well. In fact, all the people who signed that document have come to that conclusion. Yep, I Right, I thank you, Mr. Lane. So we discuss this at the end of our full agenda and you'll get a written response. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, the final public forum speaker is uh, Councillor Rutherford, who's requested uh, an audience to bring something to Council's attention that is not on the agenda. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you, uh, fellow councillors, for this opportunity. I wasn't expecting to be sitting down, but as everybody else stood, I'll, I'll, I'll do the same thing. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. So, look, um, Mr. Mayor and councillors, I just want to take the opportunity to, to speak on the matter of the upcoming um, elections. I'm, as you know, I'm seeking re election myself, and I, so I believe I'm in a position um, to, to speak to you, and particularly to those who, of you who, who are seeking. Um, re-election uh, in the upcoming uh, in the upcoming elections, and and um, I believe that I can do this from a totally unbiased position. And I will point out that it's going to be very apolitical that I speak to. Um, I want to talk to you about the tone of the um, upcoming elections. So, so it's not in, my presentation is not in regard to the politics and policies that individual candidates may bring to the campaign, but rather the style in which the campaign may be conducted. There is much white noise out there in the electorate, white noise that includes attacks on individuals, false representation of council leadership, councils and councils' decision-making processes, false information or fake news, innuendo and supposition. My request is that candidates rise above the politics of personalities and concentrate instead on the issues facing our district over the next three years and what they can bring to the table to be part of a team that goes about addressing those issues in the best interests of the community. It is very easy to be drawn into tit-for-tat debates that do nothing to advance the argument and do not help in achieving good outcomes. Candidates should instead rely on the proven principles. A good council is made up of elected members that bring a range of attributes and skills to the table and can work as a cohesive team that, under strong leadership, will result in good outcomes for the community they represent. Decisions that are evidence-based, relying on verifiable data, known and proven science, with the correct mix of community input, and in some cases, uh, personal conscience and social ethics, will result in resolutions that will be able to stand up to public scrutiny. My desire is that all potential candidates, not just those at this table, will hear this plea and we will see an election campaign that enables the voting public to make well-reasoned decisions in regard to who they would like to represent them over the next three years. When all said and done, come October, I will simply be another concerned rate payer with the same desires for a good council decision making as the rest of our wonderful community. I would be disappointed in the extreme if the, this election was defined by personalities, false information and Chinese whispers. Finally, to our CEO, Sharon and our senior leadership team, I ask that you continue to support our hardworking staff. Obviously, they too have been subjected to some unwarranted criticism and maybe having some anxieties during this time of uncertainty and change. Our staff are also members of our community and for the larger part are also ratepayers. People with families working to deliver the decisions made by the elected members 
and as such, deserve the utmost respect from their fellow community members. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Yeah. Rutherford. Questions, councillors? Councillor Hawes. Just um, as you know, that as elected members, we're bound by a code of conduct, um, and, and uh, we represent all the right powers of the district. So everybody with different views um, that are represented around this table, we have to remain neutral throughout. Um, it, it makes um, you know, uh, some difficulties uh, when you get publicly. Um, presented statements that have inaccuracies, it makes it very difficult to be able to refute that and engage in public conversation over it. Um, you know, so my question was, as an experience of hearing this commissioner, um, well experienced in the delicate balance that you, um, that you have to treat along this line, um, do you have any, anything that you can offer in managing the conflict of false information versus Response. Thanks for the question, uh, uh, Dave, Council of Wills. Um, yeah, I, I've given a lot of thought to this matter, and I know that some of you at the table have also, obviously, through some statements that have already been released to the media. Um, you know, I liken it to um, how much energy do you want to spend tilting at windmills, I guess, would be my response to that. Um, it just, you, know, you can burn up. It's hard to, to when people have a certain perception. Misinformed by maybe it's pretty difficult to to uh, to necessarily change those, and why wouldn't we just stick to the knitting that you know? Um, so my advice around that is to be very selective about what you would respond to, and if it's something that's uh, demonstrably false or or just you know false fake information, then don't really waste too much time dealing with it. Thanks. I guess it's seen one really, you made a really good point that staff, um, you know, are right players and community members as well. And, um, and, and so really, how, how destructive do you think that the negativity directed against staff is in terms of, um, if I lay staff around, um, be staff potentially improved? Sure, that's a good question as well. And perhaps that CE would be better. Uh, position to answer that. I'm not suggesting that Sharon does have this in this forum, but you know it's very clear that um, if you if you circulate through Rowan House or even socially involved with, with our staff, it definitely does impact on them. There's no question about it. Does it affect the recruiting process on them? I, I can't answer that um, because as you know we only employ one person. But suffice it to say it's difficult enough now for, for Sharon to engage um, and, and, and well-experienced, qualified staff in a lot of areas that we work in. Anything that makes that more difficult is obviously a negative in terms of our community. Yeah, um, so that's my response to that one. Um, I, know, I know that, you know, for the larger part, we've got a really good hard-working team up there and, and, and this does impact on them. They go home and... You know, their kids are oh, mum, dad, what's this about? I'm hearing about you. Yeah. Know, and it's it's destructive. Um, so I, I but I would also encourage those people I'm now talking about our staff to try and raise themselves above it, talk to our senior leadership team who um, who will, I know, already give great support to the team. And so my plea is just as that continues through this process. Thanks so. Any other questions? I'll just say to um, potential candidates that may be put off by this negativity, um, you know, what positivity could you give people that feel they have something to offer? Yeah, okay. Thank, thanks, Joe, Councillor Howard. But similar to my earlier response to Councillor Hawes, you know, just climb above that um, noise. I mean, I personally don't engage in social media platforms, um, and I know quite a number of others here don't. So how do I know that it's even happening? Well, I know because those who do engage in social media will pass on a message, oh, so-and-so said something, rather, is that true or, or otherwise? But by and large, unless you've got a real particular bent for, for uh, self-destruction, don't, don't get involved in, in, in those types of games that are out there. And um, I, I am really hopeful that, you know, what we're saying here today is that 
any people who do make themselves available will understand this message and, and, and not bring those to the table and put themselves above it. Very good. I'll just close with one quick um, quote. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, follow uh, American politics, but um, the um, ex Vice President Mike Pence at a, uh, yesterday when questioned about his relationship with President Trump and how that might impact on you know, the future of the Republican Party. He simply said, some people will choose to, um, sorry, sorry guys, some people may choose to focus on the past, but elections are about the future. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Rutherford. Right, that brings to a close, and you'll get a written response from this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to declare an interest in the public forum response. Um, right, finally, a presentation from Cheyenne. Welcome. So Cheyenne is my two-year um, candidate or recipient. So she's going to talk us through some recent experience on the program. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, or time I may or to unhappy. So, welcome to everybody who's come here this afternoon. Uh, now maybe to my finua, to my queen, just important to always recognize my finua when you're in the room, not in the room. Um, I just wanted to share with you my gratitude and my learning so far for the Tuya program. Tuya is a program funded by local council. So, thank you very much. Um, and what it does is that. Elected Māori Daugatahi, so young Māori people in those local areas are elected to come together, um, ultimately to learn. So for me, it was about learning, it was about connecting, and it was about empowering ourselves as young Māori, hopefully future leaders. Um, so the first one that we went to, or workshop, um, was held in Tokanui. So if you know where Hamilton is, you go a little bit south to Te Aumutu, and then you drive a little bit further south to Tokunui. And this area, the mana whenua of this area is Ngāti Mani Okoto. Um, something I would love for you all to take away with you is um, just a small, a small nahi no moment. So Ngāti Mani Okoto is an iwi. Ngāti means like of the or ancestor of. So Mani Okoto is a person. And this is the depiction of Rimi Maniokoto. So he is their progenitor or their ancestor who created this iwi. So every time you hear Ngati or Ngai or Te Whanau A, that is a, a title saying of this ancestor. So Ngati Waiwai, the ancestor of Waiwai. So I think there's real beauty in knowing the iwi is really an embodiment of that person and that characteristic. So we went to Dewey Mani Okoto's Marae, this is known as Bunga Tua Tua. Shoot to the next photo. This here is a po. A po is a carving or a depiction of either a story or an ancestor. This story here is, um, it's actually quite harrowing and I won't go into it, but it's a beautiful story too. You might not see it, but from the modern, it talks about this place being an abundance of food. So this here is tuna or eel. And what happened in the story was quite it was, it was tragic. And what happened was that people people passed away. Um, and these flames are depicting how they passed. And as you move up this story, what you find is what uh, Ngāti Mani Okoto, the ancestors of Mani Okoto, what they did with um, their tragedy. They grew from this and they made something absolutely beautiful. So um, next time you go past the Po and you can read or you can see, you'll find that it's a really beautiful and visual story. So that was just one example. We'll get to the next one. So um, this is Te Ihua or Manu, I believe, and that's the name of the Monai, and that's just a depiction from the outside. I thought it just looked really beautiful and I wanted to share it with you. Um, on the next one, um, I talked about learning, connecting, and empowering. This is one of those examples of us connecting. We were playing a name game, and I just wanted to point out that this is me, and I did a really good job. <laughs> I got everybody's name, so I was really pleased with myself. I wanted to share that one. <laughs> Next one, please. 
Um, this is another example of how we connect. In Māori, we have something called a porofita, which you also have in it's a circle. The importance of a porofita is that you can see everybody's face in this room, and when we speak to one another, we're speaking to all of us, and that was one way that we connected to, in a porofita, a circle. <coughs> this town is called kore tinana. So tinana is your body, and kore is the first thing or something that you're going to go and do. So we're going to move our bodies in the morning. We were really privileged to wake up at 7 a.m. and breathe the crisp air and engage in activities. You can tell because we've got bags under our eyes, really bad hair and hoodies, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll jump to the next one. Um, this here was a discussion that we had around community development. What does that look like for us, Lamatahi, and how will we contribute to our community as part of our TWIA program? Um, something I had initially thought about was how can I embrace and integrate to Māori in our community? It's something I'm passionate about, something that I love. Um, sitting in this tiny profita or profita iti, small, um, was that sometimes our communities might want to actually be in a place to engage and be ready for that kind of learning because our basic needs might not be met. So, you know, if you're not sleeping well, if you're feeling stressed out, if you're feeling anxious, you know that you're not able to take in as much information. And I think something from that call and all that conversation was, you know, as a community, are we in a space to be open and engage that learning given all the, the kind of stress and the impact we've had so far? So there's a really good vocabulary or thought to think about. Next one. This is just the top of um um, and again, it's just it's just nice to see a cool photo. <laughs> this year is Marika Hicks. Some of you might know her, some of you might not. She is a Westport local and an absolutely beautiful human being. I just wanted to share her photo because this is somebody who's grown up in a small rural town, who's embraced her Māori tanga, what it means to be Māori, and she proudly wears her kōwai. And I just wanted to acknowledge her as a local of our community in my presentation. Um, again, another porofita iti, another small circle where we had to come up with a chant or a phrase in Māori to describe what we wanted to achieve. Um, ours was interesting um, and it was good, but I don't think I'll share that with you today. <laughs> again, it's just another depiction of the marae. This was the initial one, te aroha or ihua, and something about Ngāti Mangia Pōtua as an iwi is that they were always um, kind, giving, and often were people that you went to to seek um, peace uh, during their land wars. Um, Māori went to them, and there's a river that would divide the boundaries, and Ngāti Mangia Pōtua would welcome them always. So it talks about the love of Ihua. Um, something really cool that they do in Tukunui is they've got Pumu River here. So Pumu is their river, their awa, and they seek to restore it and bring it back to its natural beauty. So they've got a nursery um, at the back of them and I, and we really contributed some of our time um, yeah, to them to learn about what a nursery is and how they've looked to restore their awa. And part of that was stacking up a bunch of plastic pots. Really cool discussion was how do we minimise the use of plastic. So I thought that was a cool image to share. That there, te maro ihua, there we go. That there is the entrance into the marae. I believe this is my friend Raquel, and this is just another example of how we assisted at the nursery. We learned about toy toy, which is a native plant in New Zealand, and unfortunately this toy toy had been um, affected by disease. So we were asked to um, get rid of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, this here is my friend Tikuna and something I learned about Tikuna is that, um, like, if you look at him, and I'm, you know, I, I was humbled by my judgment, but this is a fellow who's got dyed blonde hair, he's missing all his front teeth, he's dark as dark, and initially my thoughts were, what am I going to learn from this person? Um, and Tikuna really humbled me um, for his appearance. And the way that he dressed and all those things, he had such a wealth of knowledge. And his name, Tipuna Kore. Tipuna means ancestor and Kore means none. And when he was named, his grandfather was a Māori man and a lovely Pākehā woman. And his tribe turned away. And they said, you're no longer going to have ancestors of ours that are Māori. And 
His grandfather, who absolutely loved his wife, they had eight children, and those children had children, and that's where Tipuna Kore comes from. Tipuna Kore is a fine example of how Te Reo Māori language embraces and absolutely emotionally, you know, invigorates who he is and where he's come from. And it was a, a humbling pleasure to make this to make this tani, and I'm so excited to meet him next week. We go on our second mind money next week. This is talk come on. This is just how we all felt. Just so smiley, so connected. Yeah. And this is me. I'm weedy, and this is my gigantic water bottle that keeps me hydrated. Um, a lot of time spent in that nursery was really just reflecting about um, what does it mean to be Māori? What does it mean to be in a space with other Māori Bangatahi and what are our aspirations? And that can be a really beautiful moment. And that's us in the again. This is one of the leaders here. Um, she too carries a moko kawai, which is one of those um, tattoos that sit on your, well, I wouldn't say tattoo, but it's a moko that sits on her face that represents her ancestry. So yeah, that's me. I just, I wanted to come and share my gratitude because it's not my money that's being spent, and I would like you all to know that it's money being spent well. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> so we're going to do a round of applause and then we're going to ask questions. <laughs> Any questions, councillors? Just one comment. Very well done and very engaging. You've taken us into the into the um, space that you were in there. Mm. Um, and that's just, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank oh, you very much. Thanks for letting me go. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Wilson. Uh, very well done. Um, do you get, um, like obviously this is all around New Zealand, mm. uh, do, do you get a good engagement from the guys or is it? Is there a lot more percentage of women going on the list? Oh, I think for this particular co-copa, there might be a few more like here in time, a few more women than men. Um, I can't say why, but the men that are there are pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Right. We've we'll declared the meeting open, so we'll move to our agenda proper now. Councillors and agenda item one is apologies. Everyone's here, I think. So there are no apologies. I'll move that way. There are none. No apologies to record. Deputy Mayor Roach seconded. All those in favour? Any against? Urge unanimously. Members' interests. Agenda item two. Are there any items on today's agenda for which members wish to disclose uh, financial or non financial interest? None to record. Do I move that way, Mr. Horse? Just not that full Mr. Rutherford. Thank you. Seconded, Councillor Montgomery. All those in favour? Against. Carried unanimously. Agenda <laughs> item three is the confirmation of minutes um, from the council meeting held 29 June. Are there any matters of uh, correction? Required, I note there's been, do you want to speak to that, Deputy? Um, no, particularly, but I've, just, I've done a number of minor corrections. I'm not proposing to go through each of them, which I've sent through to Gina. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't change the context of the, the actual minutes, which is great. Here, we'll see. We'll see those. Cool. Happy to move with those amendments. Any other corrections, changes? So with those minor amendments provided to direct to um, Gina, deputy has moved. Somebody second the minutes. Seconded Councillor Weston. All those in favour? Any against? It's carried unanimously. The action point list, currently nothing on it. I will move that it be, there are no actions outstanding. Seconded Councillor Hawes. All those in favour? Any against? It's carried. Right. Uh, the agenda item five is the CEO report. And I will ask Ms. Mason to indulge us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This will be a joint report. I'm spoken to by myself and Deputy Chief Executive um, Rachel Tyrone because I was away part of last week. So the report is half and half. 
actually, uh, before I go into the report, I'd like to do some a, a quick introduction to you um, and also note um, an email that I sent out shortly before Council. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Douglas Marshall, um, who is sitting behind you. Thanks. Yeah, stand up with um, So Douglas um, has come to work with Council um, for a 12 month contract. I've brought Douglas in. We've got some external funding from the Department of Internal Affairs to um, bring in a Chief Financial Officer to support Council um, as we've got this large sum of additional funding coming in. Um, and, you know, that's really important. I think we've had enough conversations <coughs> talking about maybe doubling, almost tripling our uh, revenue throughput into the organisation, which creates a lot of challenges for small organisations. So um, thank you to the Department of Internal Affairs. They have provided um, external funding, so there is no additional cost to our ratepayers. Um, Douglas comes from um, a local government background and many years um, as a corporate and co uh, commercial um, general manager um, from another council. So it's really exciting. This is his two and a half days on the job. So um, we're really excited to have him as, as part of this. And what that will do will also allow um, Rod is very much still in position and we'll have a focus on um, the port and the airport because we know, you know, the, the port is um, now going to be a, a fully established up and functioning port. And so it's us bringing our port strategy to life, which is really exciting. So, um, so welcome, Douglas. I also um, want to acknowledge and counsel as my apologies. Many of you may not see the, have seen the email that I sent out by quarter past two. <laughs> Um, but um, I, I'm delighted to advise that um, they're mic'd up. Uh, who is our GM for infrastructure services has accepted a 12, 12 months of complement as a, a, a director to work with the National Transition Unit and the Three Waters Reforms um, to assist with the establishment of Entity D. Um, and that's a really exciting and wonderful opportunity. Um, and this is Buller putting our hand up to say, pick us. We, we will work through establishing this. So really congratulations um, to Mike, it's uh, wonderful. And he's the ideal person with the, the strategy skills and expertise that he brings in the water sector. And welcome and thank you to Mike Williams, who is stepping up into the GM role um, infrastructure. So technically to all intents and purposes, Mike does final uh, council meeting in his current role, but you will see more of Mike. Um, he is working primarily with the Department of Internal Affairs, but has that strong linkage back into Buller District Council. And you will see him back here in a different way in terms of engaging with council and having that interface around that transition to the new entity. So, um, congratulations to you guys. Um, with regards to my section of the report, um, you will see that there are some recommendations there which I will um, have Rachel talk to. I just want to draw your attention to very quickly the climate change project update. Di Rossiter um, is doing some fantastic work and um, thank you to Councillor Phil for being our governance champion. Uh, around the, our climate change adaption um, project as agreed to in the, the long-term plan. Um, Di uh, brought in some really fantastic expertise and ran a series of workshops um, earlier this month um, and is now taking on board the information that's come out of those workshops, which she will distill and analyse, and we will look forward to presenting back to Council, but it will be the new Council. Um, and with that high level information and the risk assessment, then we will seek to go out to our community in the early part of next year and run some engagement workshops um, around climate change across the district. So really good progress. And I just really want to draw your attention to that. The second component is that we have a significant coup uh, in that Buller will be hosting um, a hui. Um, with KMTT. So this is the top of the South Island partnership that BDC has with Nelson Councils, um, with uh, Nine Iwi, with um, the Department of Conservation, um, and uh, 
we have been working collaboratively together and it fits very much in with our economic uh, development strategy around focusing on um, uh, climate change opportunities um, and the green dollar to actually further develop the, the strategy and what the opportunities are for the, the Buller district. And so we've put our hands up and we are going to host um, the top of the South Island um, HUI to work through the new strategy. So that's really exciting that HUI takes place next week from Monday through to um, Wednesday. Um, and we really look forward to um, welcoming our partners around the table um, and really look forward to seeing how those workshops pan out. So that's really fantastic news for, for Buller to be the host. And good for our community because it brings people in who will be staying here and will be spending money locally as well. So that is absolutely fantastic, and particularly in the winter months. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to uh, Deputy Chief Exec Rachel. Thank you very much. Touching first on item six in the report, the recovery transition. As we previously talked about, the core recovery team that's been operating for the agency for the past 12 months is coming to an end this week as we transition that flood recovery over to a new phase, which is more focused around the infrastructure recovery, the resilience and the rebuild program. This was always the intention. The core team was there to set up and establish those support services for the community to help people through those early stages and keep them with the support that they needed, with the idea that you know, those NGOs and other agencies would be in our community operating and able to, to stand on their own feet and do that forward. I'm really fortunate that we have got to that position 12 months on and those supports will be able to continue. Of course, what that means, and it's a bit of sweet moment, is that a number of our core team will be leaving us at the end of the week. Uh, in particular, Bob Dixon, who's been recovery manager, Rick Barry, who's been working in the built environment space, Shane Barry in the social and welfare space, and of course, C over there, who's been dabbling in all of it. And, keeping us honest and smiling for our rules. So I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the outstanding and amazing work that team people have done over the past 12 months and it's been privileged to work with them. The commitment, the passion, the dedication and the support for our community that they have brought each and every single day through what's been a really challenging time and we'll be learning and building a plan as we've been flying it. It's been, I'm going to borrow a seat with humbling, and just a, a privilege and a privilege to work with them. So I would like to acknowledge and thank them for everything that they've done for, for Harper and for the community in the time that we have been working through that. And as you know from the report and the earlier, those key services for the people, because we know that people are still working through their recovery, they will continue with the community hub continuing to, to operate, the continuum over our navigator service continuing on. We've got a small team that will keep going just to make sure that transition follows through. Still communications to come, still events to come through, so you can not the last of recovery yet that we're still going. <laughs> uh, the other thing I'd like to highlight from the report is around the form submissions that we have happening at the moment. I'll touch first on the national policy statement for Indigenous biodiversity. You'll we'll see there is a draft proposed submission here on behalf of the four West Coast Councils. I'd like to thank and acknowledge West Coast Regional Council and their technical staff for taking the lead in pulling that together. You'll note that it's 46 pages long and it does go into very technical detail around what is an essentially very technical detailed document. I think they've done an excellent job pulling that together. Uh, the other three West Coast Councils have signed on to that submission. There have been uh, two minor changes to the submission as presented in your agenda. Uh, these have come by the Great District Council, where unlike all of the Western Grain, we've already identified some of the natural areas that differ from the district plan. So they've suggested an amendment whereby, where they already exist, you wouldn't get caught up in the provisions of this policy statement and have to redo them again within an unreasonable time frame. So they added an additional recommendation. Uh, any exemption that exists in these that should be reviewed, do not need to be reviewed again within 10 years from when that review was undertaken, and provided some explanatory detail on the order which I've been allowed out to councillors this afternoon. I uh, recommend that councillors endorse the submission with that, that amendment as put forward by the Great District Council. Uh, relating to the stewardship plan review, the Department of Conservation announced yesterday that the submission timeframe has been extended for everybody until the 24th of August. 
I can't make basic stuff with the free speech. Our council actually did not endorse a final submission today on behalf of the council. So actually we would like some more time to go back and just revise and refine and take an opportunity to look at some of the detail, in greater detail. And with the replacing the chairperson we suggest and in that resolution to bring this back to our FRAC, the so-called FRAC meeting, which times quite nicely with the closing discussion process. Yes, that's fine. <coughs> we'll just work on some reading. I'm just doing it now. Okay, cool. Is that it? Questions, councillors, on the broad CEO report? Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, well, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm just not sure whether it's appropriate or not, but I don't know. Thanks, Rachel, for giving us an update on the team that's uh, worked on behalf of this uh, of our community over this rather traumatic period. And I'll be guided, Mr. Mayor, by your thoughts on this. Um, do you believe it's appropriate that as a governance group we acknowledge the work that they've done and thank them as they leave? As they leave? Yeah. I really view those people with a different regard. Uh, they've gone up above and beyond the call in many cases, and I know that our, they'll be thanked by, our, by, our, by uh, Sharon and her team, but I just would like to recall that thanks on behalf of the Aboriginal Governance Group, and maybe we could uh, resolve to do that possibly. Yep, happy to. Would you like a letter written? Or... I think it's, that would be reasonably appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yep, like right that. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Simpson? Uh, just on the three waters transition funding, um, that money coming to council, so what are they likely to be, um, right, you know, withdraw the expertise? Um, to support through the three waters transition. So, what sort of expertise are they likely to be looking at? Thank you. Um, so, that's in recognition that this isn't just about infrastructure. So, there's a huge component around staffing, there's a, a significant human resources component, there's a significant financial component. So, um, uh, central government have recognised that it would be very challenging for councils to be able to do this work off the side of their desk. So what we will be seeking to do is to um, bring um, uh, backfill or bring in some HR expertise that works through all of the different machinations. It's a huge piece of work. It's a huge body of work. And it actually makes quite a refreshing change that um, central government are actually providing some funding to bring some expertise and to enable that to happen because usually we have to try and do it off the side of our desks and, and it's really hard to be able to manage business as usual as well as um, trying to step through what transformation looks like because it, it will be quite significant. So just to carry on, so it won't necessarily, necessarily be one person that would be... It, it a number of people in yeah. different areas. That, that's right. Yeah. So the, the, the funding will sit with the CEO. It, it's operational funding. And, and as we begin to understand what the transition looks like, um, so already we're involved in conversations around HR about what it means for our staff and the transition. What will happen is we'll probably pull together or I'll form a very small um, business or entity or unit with a process <laughs> around it so that we know what resource we need and what information that we need to enable that to happen. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Ned. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I haven't got a question. I suppose it's, it's more about um, Sharon. You allow um, your staff to attend the Orphity um, on Monday for the other um, and hopefully um, some of the councils will um, be able to turn up as well. Now, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you why, this hui that's going to be held. It's the first of its type on the coast. Very lucky, and I, I guess we've got to thank um, Donna Rossler for the work that she's put into this as well, because of um, her being able to get 
uh, on my knee, which on the top myself down here as well. So it's very important, but it's important in terms of um, the bullet um, as a whole as well, because it's really putting him out there. The other thing is if I could also ask, uh, if we've been there at uh, half past nine, uh, because apparently there's going to be quite a few people at this hallway uh, as well. So if you're there early, you'll probably get a seat. <laughs> Thanks, Ned. <coughs> Councillor Howard. I want to just say sort of like that um, Mike and Mike, uh, one for uh, the promotion, one for being part of the transition. Maybe that, um, I think it's acknowledgement of all the work you've been doing and um, the great knowledge that uh, we have of the district and water issues. So, um, well done, yeah, both you and thanks for what you've got in. Um, I'm pleased to see in um, the draft submission around the um, stewardship land is that you acknowledging that they haven't addressed the poor well-being. So I think that came before we were looking at setting up a community centre in uh, Pernicliki. There was a need from the community, but under um, the um, conservation land that didn't allow for that community use. I think it's really, really important though in our district with the high centre land tied up. So um, it's good to see that knowledge and look at the final draft. And um, last thing, I'm really excited. I've actually um, been invited to attend um, the Hoey um, Monday to Wednesday. So I'm really looking forward to that and uh, what, what comes out of those um, ideas local, but also thinking to um, understand what other areas are doing. Let's see it. Right, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Weston. It's just a concern um, what the SNA is at the moment. I've had a uh, concerned person come up and said that they've received, um, they had a significant natural area on their property and they, it was there's a pre European cemetery down the front of their property as well as a wetland. But this is not on her property. So she was quite concerned how she sort of, how whoever got the information saw that it was on her property when it was on somebody else's property. So I asked her, I said to her she wanted to put a submission over it. Um, she could do, and this is, this is for, <coughs> excuse me, TTPP. Mm. So in the first instance, I would contact the staff because there have been other examples where yeah. mapping hasn't exactly lined up with property titles. So that there may be an error there that's worth investigating, but yeah. otherwise a, um, a submission, yes. Yeah. Councillor Rutherford. Well, no, thanks for me. I just endorse what you just said. In fact, it's just uh, been released today. That, uh, it was an really. Those types of errors they are, will be corrected and the people will be duly notified. Yeah. Any other questions? Right, thank you. So I'll just um, yeah, just reiterate the um, thanks to um, Mike Duff, particularly, uh, heading off on a, a uh, new role, new challenge, future, sure. absolutely. And, uh, and Mike, Mike uh, Williams, great to have you stepping up into that role as well. Right, so we need to turn our mind to the resolutions. So we have one there that we note the content of the CE report. Um, and the second one is endorsing all the district council inclusion in the combined West Coast Council submission on the exposure draft and implementation plan for the national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity. And I think we should add in there um, supporting the amendments and additions um, annexed by the Grey District or, or yes, along those lines. What's the conditions of recommendation eight made by Grey District? Let's deal with those two first. I move that way. Councillor Rutherford, seconding. Seconded Councillor Rutherford. Any other discussion on that? So we're noting the C report and we're endorsing the MPSIB submission. All those in favour? Any against? That's carried unanimously. Now, the third one is, is uh, we'll leave on the table. And I will suggest a, um, 
a new wording given the new time frame and the additional work that the team have indicated they want to do on this um, stewardship land review submission uh, that council delegates to the finance risk and audit committee to consider and endorse a submission to the stewardship land review process on behalf of all district council so effectively just resolving that frac will be the um, appropriate committee to consider that draft when it's ready so i've moved that way seconded councillor hawes everybody understand the rationale there any questions Yep. Uh, all those in favour? Any against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. I think you've already got it. Okay. Um, right. Thank you. Get back to my agenda. Right. We're on to the Mayor's report. Um, I don't know that there's a lot. We'll take most of that as read. Um, the mirror relief fund, um, as you can see there, is um, is drawing down. But there is still some funds in there. Uh, I had a discussion today with uh, with the committee, um, Councillor Rutherford, Deputy Mayor Roach, and um, and Ned Tuffley around the future and how we'll keep going with that fund. So we'll keep that fund. The intention is to keep the current structure and committee in place for the rest of this term, uh, in which case it then will revert really to to, uh, um, to applications coming direct to me. So um, I guess the, the word is, uh, the preference would be that applications get in sooner rather than later. Um, but noting there was discussion around um, some fund being kept or made available. Um, there may well be demand on that as um, particularly as residents move into the um, new accommodation village in Elmer Road. So um, that's uh, just worth noting. Um, the rest of that is pretty self-explanatory. In terms of correspondence, I'll draw your attention to the reply from um, Waka Kotahi to the letter penned by myself and um, uh, Minister O'Connor regarding the Kalmia um, SPR. Um, I don't know if, Mike, have you read that letter or not, but um, there's a couple of things in there that... Um, I'm not sure whether it warrants reply, but we need to consider our position um, going forward. Do you have any comment on them? Have you seen the letter and comment? I just noted that the, the, I guess the main clause that, that concerned me was uh, while council delivers uh, develops a transition plan to present to the Waka Katahi board, um, the FAR for, the, for its SPRs has been set at 100%. So I'm just, I wasn't aware that that we were necessarily proactively developing a transition plan. I thought that was more their plan. Correct, uh, Mr. Mayor. So I uh, uh, guess the latest noted and, uh, and at a time on a suitable response um, should go back. And, and in particular, uh, to our understanding, um, council position on the SBR has not changed uh, over the intervening months and years now. Um, and I would, I would suggest that the transition plan is is actually the uh, agency's plan seeking council's approval of which there has been none. Mm. Uh, and there's been some subsequent uh, matters, particularly to do with the SPR road uh, following the February flood events. Uh, and so there's a lot to work through. But uh, I understand council's position hasn't changed from what it was previously. Thank you. So, well, I, I seek the uh, Council's endorsement for me to uh, work with our infrastructure roading team on a suitable response. Councillor Hawes. Yeah, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> just say that I took some heart from the second last paragraph on page 123 of Mr. Cable's letter. We appreciate that there are different speakers regarding why the road should be state highways or local roads. Well, Waka Katahi is currently considering a policy review of the state highway criteria, and we would welcome Water District Council input to this process in due course. This is expected to involve a consultation phase in 2022 23. So, what I'm saying here is that we should write a letter of reply to Mr. Cable and say that we're more than actively um, seek to involve that process because the only way out of this is for that criteria. Um, 
which stipulates what constitutes a state highway to include Caribbean um, Highway. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck by it. There will be no going back if this criteria doesn't change. So yep. I would suggest the letter needs to go that way. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Sampson? I'd like to endorse that because that's what I was going to um, speak on. But also, just communications as such, because you know, I thought we wanted to be having the council um, having more frequent communications regarding the um, transition. But has there been any of what was it just sort of dropped by the way? Because, you know, this is reporting the opposite that we were coming up with a transition plan, and I, like yourself, understood yeah. that it was a joint venture. But um, well, there's what communications. So there's definitely there is definitely a document which is called a draft transition plan, yeah. but it is draft and well, hasn't been I accepted by a council. Do you want to speak further? Mind there was a number of items in there that have been chipping away at, there were improvements like to the bridges and, and bits and pieces, the bit of ceiling at Kahai High and different things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just been dropped out. Yeah. Yes, there has been a lull in, in communication, uh, but we always felt actually this is the initiative of the agency. And as a, as a partner and as a collaborator in that, uh, of course, we have a role to play. Um, but our, our position uh, by the council has made very clear that the draft transition plan circa 2019, I think, uh, now, uh, certainly didn't, um, uh, didn't appeal to this council, particularly because of the risk element of having to fund uh, what were, uh, was regarded as an unquantifiable risk of the bluff section of road. And uh, to our mind, that has not improved. Uh, and uh, uh, actually reveal itself um, from the February event uh, to, to be exactly what it was and is. So uh, whilst we're a willing partner and of course we'll be engaged with the agency, uh, I don't think that um, a lack of communication has been uh, on our, uh, the onus on us. Uh, we're certainly waiting for a more appealing and palatable proposition from the agency which just hasn't arrived. Yeah. Uh, but I certainly agree with Councillor Dawes' view that at least there appears to be a way of hope that the agency is considering the whole thing um, and maybe that's our opportunity to put this case as part of that. Mm. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, thank, thanks for being here. Uh, I just wanted to say I had the pleasure of travelling up to Caribbean yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and all I can say is that it's sort of got quite technical um, description into plain language. If we cannot transition this road to state highway, God help the right parties of both. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, that's fine. Let's got some notes there, and I'll work with um, Mike and the team around it. Reply just to clarify our position or restate our position, and, and obviously acknowledge the invitation to be a part of the um, state highway criteria criteria review because um, that is a positive way forward. Cool. Um, anything else in my? Then there is any other questions out of the mayor's report on my activities. Would you like to move it? Moved. Uh, Councillor Na. Seconded. Councillor Howard. All those in favour? Any against? It's carried. Thank you. Um, right. We go on to verbal updates from committee chairs. And we will start with Anangahu Hill Community Board Chair Belgian. Very kind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, um, not much this week, uh, this month, but uh, one of the highlights of the year, and I seem to recall three years ago, at about this time, that the last ICD meeting of the year, this the Nangaroo Community Board meeting, was really well attended by um, those who are wishing to seek re-election. So um, both of you are welcome. <laughs> well, um, and this mayor, of course, comes along every time anyway. So I assume you'll be at the last one. And uh, there'll be some riveting discussion at that meeting. Uh, one will be the uh, report back from the Globe Mine as to the um, 
I call the restoration project and the uh, what's going to happen in terms of uh, what's going to be left there for the community in terms of bike tracks and other bits and pieces. There's been a huge amount of, um, you were read in the, in the, in the media, uh, interest from nine parties who have written literally thousands of pages of these submissions. And so it's become something which is uh, 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 much talked about and briefed. So we used to see what, what Oceana come back with on that. Um, that's there, and then there's other things I'm sure like super value will, of course, emerge as a topic of discussion. Uh, which we seem to have no joy from what on, uh, but there are some plans in place which might get their attention. So um, <laughs> perhaps not in the written form from Mike. The, um, the, you would have noticed been a wee bit of um, media attention on Reefton and the Nangahua over the last week or two, and um, not just the medical situation, um, so, but I was pleased yesterday at a meeting uh, between, it was called between Federation Mining and um, uh, De Develop West Coast. We had the, the heads of both those organisations came along and to work out exactly what their accommodation needs will be. And uh, because there's been much talk about the needs, but no one's actually sat down and said, well, look, if, if it happens, what, are, what is it? And it's huge. So, uh, Tell West Coast are now fully aware of it. Um, they're offering to be very supportive in terms of making um, the housing um, happen. And so that's gratefully received. But the most important thing was uh, well, one of the important things was to hear that uh, the Health Trust had met the day before. And uh, the subject was to Reefton's medical um, dilemma. Uh, was on the table, and so that has been discussed. And one would hope that that will continue through. And from Federation and Mining point of view, that they um, are cognizant of it and willing to aid, as will others in the field. Because one thing you must realise about Reefton, and not many people actually have cotton on to this, is we just don't have Federation Mining, uh, who are currently spending sixty-five million dollars. Burrowing two, two holes down to um, 500 metres below sea level. Uh, but we've got uh, Reefton Gold and Siren Gold who are doing drilling uh, just um, on the outskirts of town, both finding really good samples and uh, cool samples. And there's, there's a high chance that uh, the gold rush will be um, happening um, anytime soon. And this is this is real, this is data, this is core samples, this is actually happening. And we cannot sit back and just go, it'll be okay. We must be ensuring, and I implore the next council, uh, which I'll not be sitting on, but I implore the next council to do everything they can to free up land for onto which some housing can be put. And that's housing not of a temporary nature, but this is for the families that will be coming to work in, for the, in these ventures. And we already have a shortage of biblical proportions of houses in town. There is not a house for rent, not one. So if you put the word out, I, I, I can get 10 calls from it. The house for sale, number two or three, and they're mostly overpriced at the moment. So hoping they haven't, they don't really want to sell them, they get the price on doing it. So essentially, nothing for sale, nothing for rent, and where the heck we're going to put all these people who are coming, and we need them to come. And that's before you even talk about tourists, which are coming anyway. So this is, there's nothing needed for all this, this is just sensational stuff. And we just need to make, uh, to be aware of it and to make it happen. Now, I've belted on about this for, for three years now, and it's um, actually come to fruition. So that's all good. And I'd just like to say that's all, and hopefully see um, all of you here for the next the ICB. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, excellent um, description of the accommodation shortage. I just wish you were prepared to do that for News Talk ZB at 10 past five in the morning, <laughs> instead of deferring to the Mayor. I have to say, I did get a call from, and they said we'd come on live, live radio. 
and I said, oh, I'm on holiday and never going to do it. Oh, okay, what time? And they said, 5.15 a.m. I said, not me. <laughs> I said, who else would do it? And I said, the media will probably have it. <laughs> hoping that they would do it. So they, they duly won. And, and, and you got up and you sounded great. <laughs> and you had a total grasp of the situation. So thank you. I'm a morning person. <laughs> uh, Sharon just wants to... Thank you, Mr. Matt. I've got to speak with my Buller Health Trustee hat on just to, to clarify. We, we had a very good meeting, but it wasn't as Buller Health Trustees. We have a regular relationship meeting with Federation Mining. And, um, but I just want to be very clear, as, as I think we discussed at the annual plan, the Buller Health Trust has no plans to set up a service in Reefton. What we have talked about is being a provider to enable continuity of care to provide occupational health services and what that would look like in terms of them being able to bring employees through, um, just as we described at the annual plan about needing to keep a critical mass of the staff in one place. So um, I will follow up with them in case they have misunderstood. But I just wanted to be really clear that the trust is not setting up and establishing a primary care practice. In Thank you. So if that is the case, <laughs> can I then employ you um, to become, um, we have a situation at the moment where we do, do not have a doctor in town. What we have is a TV screen, and that at the other end of the TV screen, I presume there's a camera somewhere on it, much like doing a Zoom call, there's a doctor probably there who will um, um, help you. Lord only help you if you've got a problem with your bottom. I mean, how the heck are you going to describe you know, your, your issue to someone who is going to be looking through a camera? It is a ludicrous situation. So the, the, the level of, of um, care that is provided by that, it's fine if you can renew your medications, it's fine if you, I don't know, got a cough or something and somebody can listen to your test, but there, there's a number of issues that cannot be attended to over a TV screen. And uh, that is what we've got at the moment. And the other thing that comes into it, if we, as we've been saying, is that uh, we are now I'm hearing stories of families having to take their two-year-old to, to drive to Greymouth at two o'clock in the morning because they're having an asthma attack. Now, could they have got that in, in, in Reefton before? Two or three years ago, yes, because there were nurses on there for the Zana Wing and so forth. There was there was accommodations made for, for, for locals. Now there's nothing. And then you, the worst part is you get to Greymouth Hospital and you're um, then assessed whether you're emergency or whether it's just a um, some other, you know, just a bit of a checkup. If it's just a checkup, um, then you're charged $60 because you're not registered there. And you've had to pay the, the petrol money to get down there and the petrol coming back, coming back. I mean, it is, it is a ludicrous situation. And one of the key things, the fundamental things about getting families here, working in the mines, stability of, of staff, they need education, they need safety, they need recreation, and they need medical service. And if we don't have that, then we've got a big problem. So we need to be starting now to come up with some plan to with working with whatever the health department is now called, and as they're building their Boeing 747 as they're flying off into the world of, of health tourism, the uh, we need to be there as council and hopefully with the health trust which we've got there or some other entity which is going to make this happen. Because we don't have it. It's a shambles. So as an ex health professional I can respond to that in terms of that is the whole purpose and rationale behind the new um, the health reform and the locality set up and absolutely get that it is challenging as they transition through that um, and everything that you've articulated that is what needs to go back into that the, the new New Zealand health about the needs and that advocacy that goes back and certainly with the our um, council hats on the mayor and I regularly advocate um, into uh, whoever was in charge around the needs of health within uh, the Buller district 
Um, it is not unique though around the rest of the country and probably this isn't the forum for that discussion but it isn't unique and, and Buller and Reefton is not unique. There is a larger national nationwide shortage of GPs and nurses, uh, allied health, that this is it, what you see in Reefton is symptomatic of a significant national issue. So can I give one last response here, please? So um, <coughs> agree with all that. Understand it completely. But the one thing that I applauded um, this council on doing, and with your good self at the helm, has been saying this is the problem. It might be the problem everywhere else, but that's not going to be our problem. We're going to sort it out. So what I'm saying is we know what the issue is. We know that there's a problem here at the moment. Let's be enterprising. In the same way we've been with floods and COVID and God knows what else has come to here, ports that are shedding wharves at 100 miles an hour. Then let's actually make, let's actually say, this is the issue, let's sort it and do it in a better way, which is innovative and isn't relying on um, other people. That's the only point to make. And we've been very good at that. Yes. And, and we have been very good at it and we continue to be very good at it, but you actually have to have a workforce to employ to, to be able to. Um, and um, yeah, it is challenging times. We'll have a discussion though as to how we can advocate better. For all of all of yes. <clears throat> and we do that on a regular. Yeah. Council Hall. Just um, are there two issues here? Like, I mean, you're talking about GP services, which is different to hospital, which is, um, or, you know, as we know, it's Simon House, it's closed. Um, it's a separate issue. Do you think they are correlated? Do you think there is some large handling, or do you think this is just two separate things? It's um, look, I appreciate it on a national basis, it's changed, and we've been wrapped up in that. I speak to people in Auckland who can't, who literally drive an hour, so same thing, they're doing a lot slower pace than we're doing it going down to Greymouth, and they're facing a seven or eight hour wait time at Manukau or um, Auckland Hospital, just like the Grove Grove Hospital. So, I understand that the Simon House, uh, look, that's, that's a shambles beyond the shambles. Um, there, there are no nurses that they say can come here. Um, did they did they close it too early? Who knows? So from our point of view, we've lost nine elderly people from town. Uh, two of them certainly won't be coming back because they have um, got beyond uh, returning. And uh, Zyman has I. I despair, given that it was set up by Mr. Zyman and his great um, gold company, um, Consolidated Gold Mines of New Zealand, and uh, Prosperity of Region resides on it. And there we are. We had um, Greg Archer's father, Greg Archer, died the other day, and the oldest, one of the oldest families in town, all gold mining. And uh, he could not go into Zyman House, he had to die at home. And there was no palliative care available in Region. And that's from a uh, from a family that had been at the forefront of gold mining since 1869. So it's a, it's a sad old thing, but that's the way the world's gone. But once again, I think we have to be enterprising and in the Reefton way. And one thing that you go through the history of Reefton and Karamea and Westport and Prairie Bay and all places that you've never let. Uh, some obstacles get in the way and make it happen. And that is the challenge I perhaps give you know, to the next council to encourage that thinking. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Councillor Bowden? Before we move on to the next one. Spoken enough. <laughs> Thank you. No, very good, very passionate. Um, Ned, not TYY. Well, I haven't got anything as impressive as what John was for this one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I had a tour of the uh, Colour colour this morning. The uh, oh, oh, it's going to be quite impressive, you know, it's going to be um, it, was, it was quite amusing, actually. The lady that we met with, um, she's uh, 
new facilities person. You know, but she's been the one about how much money it's going to cost and all the rest of it. And for this, and we're looking at each other. So we let it carry on, and then I turned around and I said to Rob, What we're going to do for you is not going to cost anything. Should have said it probably just. But we uh yeah, we've got that we've got that part of it um sorted out. I'll tell you what, next time you're down on the Grand Yard Hospital, just take note of the um of the entrance of the main entrance area in the and the register in your mind, and when this one opens, you'll see a huge difference. And it's actually going to be better than growing our thighs. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, had a chat with um, some of the um, uh, workers around me. And um, one of their comments was they actually thought that we came from this hall. And I said, no, so we, we do a bit of work up here. But anyway, the, um, the comments that they were making about the local community and the um, support that they're getting from here, especially the builders that's come from away. And so, uh, yeah, so they say to know, I'll come back here uh, uh, any time. It's interesting you talked about um, lack of accommodation job. At any given time on this new hospital, there's 30 people with me. And the majority of them, they stay around where they work at the, uh, at the hospital. There. And that's the whole lot of reasons. One, they didn't want to take up all uh, the accommodation in town. Um, and well, as well, as you know, they pulled all their own stuff. And so that was very nice to see that here, what they were saying about the local community. That's me. Great. Thanks, Ned. Any questions for Ned? Yes. Sorry, uh, thanks. Sorry. Ned. Yeah, so, Ned, you spoke earlier um, this afternoon about. Requesting councillors who may be available to attend the pool for you Monday morning. Can you just tell me a bit more about it because I don't know. Uh, so, what are you saying? I will send you an invite and some information around it and we'll send it out to all councillors. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'll tell you when it's going to open, by the way. Cool. Oh, um, <laughs> Councillor Rutherford, regulatory hearings. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Look, I, I, I won't be offering a lot this evening other than to touch on um, the uh, work that's been undertaken in the climate change area, um, acknowledging the CE's uh, report. Um, I just want to pick up on, on that work that um, Di Ross is doing to us and thank all those elected members who did attend one or more of the sessions that she uh, conducted with some expert input. It'd be really interesting to see what drops out of that. Of course, that'll be for the, the incoming council. Um, but I just want to acknowledge, of course, that this, this whole climate change, and I don't know if you want to continue to call it climate change, it might be easier to reference to something else like um, significance of natural events. You know, there's a whole lot of noise around, you know, climate change is, is, is you know, what does that really mean? So in reality, we talk about the effect that our natural movement is having on the community. So um, in that regard, I can report that our team has been doing some really good work. You will recall we had a workshop on uh, the effect of the recent events out um, in the back country, a uh, lot front country, Hills with um, lag land um, instability. I can tell you that our team, uh, including your manager, Sean, has been out door knocking with those people that have been affected by those events. Fantastic piece of work going on there. Talking to them, um, talking to them about the report, which has had some minor updates, by the way. Oops, somebody told me, um, told me to bring it to this meeting. So, he will be um, organising a meeting with, the, with these people. It won't be a public meeting, it'll be a meeting with the affected residents, and there will be some expertise available for that to talk to them at the time as well. It's not, it's not designed to produce a specific outcome, but it's to see as a talk about the where to next. So um, that's happening. Um, 
he did indicate to me that uh, the noise around the building I think has been dropping off a wee bit and seems to be a greater acceptance amongst our local builders that yeah what we're what we're asking makes sense and so there's not the same amount of pushback happening there that doesn't mean to say that there isn't still some because there is a little bit but it's no longer where it was before which is really pleasing to hear um there's other stuff going on that's more about um management um, there are some resource consent issues that the team are dealing with and you will be also aware of course that um, our planning team is down at the moment through, through COVID and so we've been really pushed on some of our delivery uh, time, time frames uh, but that's no, that's no secret it's out there in public arena so that's something that our team are dealing with um, and of course some people are still waiting on uh, when they will be consulted on about the number of peaks that are to keep. Um, I'm assured that that's not actually calendarised yet, but it will be coming up very soon. So, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank you. Uh, Community Environment Services Councillor Montgomery. Mine is um, short and sweet because we just had our meeting uh, last week. Our next one is in September. Um, hopefully we'll have some more reports um, to that and potentially something on um, elderly housing as well. That's that all. That's any questions for Councillor Montgomery? <laughs> Deputy, do you want to cover TTPP, please? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's already been alluded to earlier in the meeting just around a few media releases um, that are out and about with regard to the TTPP. So you all know that it's been released now for consultation and there's been, um, there have been letters uh, issued throughout the East Coast, with, uh, especially with regard to areas of significance to Māori and that has caused a bit of a... Um, uh, a bit of consternation for some people. Um, so the media releases that have come out are to set people um, on the stand owners' minds at ease, really. Um, so a lot of the areas are in urban areas. Um, and we did, we had a meeting yesterday, yeah, Zoom, just to discuss this. So uh, to use an example, just to, to, to keep it pretty sort of Simple. Um, if your property was once owned by Marfia, for example, and you freeholded it at some point in the last however many years, that still remains a, um, a property of significance to Murray, and rightly so because it has a historical connection. However, that does not imply that a rule will be um, will impose anything on your property that um, that would stop you doing anything that you would normally do to that um, under general terms, and, and from those that handed about 1,500 letters went out in about 500 odd properties that were affected in that way. Um, it's more to do with more of the rural areas um, where there, there may have well have been a, um, a cemetery site that has been identified, but mostly it's nothing new that owners would normally have known. So the two media releases that have gone out are really around that and to do with GIS mapping. So I think that if people are still concerned, there will there is a lot of information on the TTP um, website around that. Um, but I'm sure that they, if especially in the Bullard district, if anyone's specifically concerned, um, I've had a couple of calls. I don't know about you, Mr. Mayor, of, of anyone that would <coughs> probably attempt to explain it. Um, but I think new letters will be going out to all of those people that originally property owners that got letters just to explain a little bit more. Some frequently asked or Q&As will be attached so in order to give people um, a bit more information. And it has been acknowledged that, that perhaps it could have been done a little bit better. Um, but anyway, if nothing else, it's drawn attention to the plan and people also can submit on it. So um, that's probably the, what's been happening in the last week or so. Um, probably nothing much more to add except that it is up on the website you can get in and you can actually key in your, I tried it out myself key in your own address um, and then it will tell you if there's anything that is attached to your, 
your property. So it might be something to do with coastal overlays or anything like that, but you can clearly see while it was um, bunched together, that's quite simple to follow how your property was affected. So if, if that's the case and you feel you want to make a submission now to be in by the 30th of September. Questions? Cool, thank you. Now, the Joint Committee Westport Rating District, I don't think has met, has it? So, probably nothing to add, Councillor Howard. Um, we could probably just highlight that there's a public Kawakiri business case presentation on the 10th of August, um, 5 30 to 7 o'clock at the Indian Theatre. Do you want to speak further to that? Yes, thank you. I just want to be really clear that that, that presentation is under the Buller Recovery and it is about um, uh, the, the business case. So it's really important to clarify that it's quite um, distinct to perhaps some of the work the West Coast Regional Council is doing during the day with regards to meeting the South Grass residents. So quite separate things and something that we've committed to under the recovery banner. Thanks for that clarification. Any questions on that? Oh, okay. Can somebody move that we receive those committee chair verbal updates? Moved. Councillor Weston, seconded. Councillor Na. All those in favour? Aye. Against? That's carried unanimously. Right. Public forum response, I think. We right. Yep. Um, right. So we had. Go back to the front. Here is some now regarding um, Palmerston Street cycle safety. Um, suggestions for a reply. Um, I note there was some email traffic from a uh, transport yes. um, staff person. Yeah, thank you. Um, if uh, councillors would be um, so kind as to indulge, um, we had a, a feeling of, about what Terry was going to ask, and we've um, had some conversations with Neil, um, who was our um, trans transport um, coordinator. Thank you. And they're they're very well aware of some of the the range of issues around. Um, um, speed and cycle, etc., and they have a piece of work that um, they, you know, keen to to be having a look at that fits within their work program. So, if councillors are okay, we can um, suggest to the mayor that he writes back and, and says that this is very much on our radar, and perhaps give the mayor a little bit more detail about our intentions and the work program that we will be seeking to look at and over what time frame. Councillor Hawes. <coughs> Um, I just um, felt that, you know, probably what's being asked here um, fits within the, um, the broader picture of what's happening in terms of um, you know, the linkage through the, to the waterfront, the whole of the um, town development, if you like. So, talking about a, um, an initiative and planning initiative for the central town. So, it would not be advisable to actually incorporate in some of this. Once the report comes back into the bigger picture of that planning, so that's part of the work that so that's a it's a collaboration between transport and the work Glen Irving's doing around the connect trails, and there's a mixture of things around signage and pathways and whatever. Yep. So I just need some clarity on what that actually is, and I'll convey that to Mr. Sumner as part of his answer. Cool. Right, um, Mr. Lane, the Cons Creek petition. Um, staff advice on that because there's a process around yeah. petitions. Yes, in terms of we will um, share the the uh, petition with um, with councillors. Um, and in terms of um, we'll have to have some um, possibly some further conversations with Kevin offline because the the title of the petition. There is no proposal attached to the petition other than Kevin, what you have read out, which the title of your petition and what you have read out is contrary to yeah. each other. So I suspect that um, our advice would be suggesting that um, perhaps you provide some documents with further clarification that would, would go because your speech and the, uh, the title of your petition is 
two quite different things. So I I will um, seek to work with Kevin to provide that to bring something of um, more detail, for Kevin to bring something of more detail back to Council. So I think our reply from this meeting to public forum will be that the petition is received and has been, we have asked um, the Chief Executive to work with you further on, or work with Mr Lane further. <laughs> Normally the people don't sit around to hear this, but <laughs> to work, with, um, work with Mr Lane further on um, on the proposal and future yeah, advice okay. to council. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's cool. Um, Councillor, oh, big your pardon. So therefore it will come back um, after two parties meeting, getting it. The petition correct, it will come back to council again. Well, it, it will need to come back because it's yeah. the, the, the headline of the petition and um, what Mr. Lean has spoken about it's two different things. So we will seek, ask Mr. Lean to come back with clarity about what the proposition actually yeah. is. So, what is the process then, bearing in mind we're at the end, coming to the end of the term before an election? Can um, a lot be done because it will be a major um, or a significant change if we're going to do anything? Can that be done? Or so in, in terms of, um, it depends what the proposition is. And then until at the moment, um, from what I can read, the proposition is not clear. So until we actually have a proposition in front of us, it's very challenging for councillors to have enough detail to make a decision as to whether to leave something on the table or carry it forward to next council. It is considered as business as usual because it's a live and active program of work, but it very much would depend on what the proposal is. But at the moment, there is a resolution passed by council. So, and so the normal threshold to alter that at the moment would be the normal standing orders process around that, that's basically support from yeah. Whatever it is for councillors or whatever. Um, okay, so that can be handled operationally. Cool. Now, Councillor Rutherford's um, presentation, speech. Thank him, acknowledge him, applaud him. Could I make a comment in terms of the councillors, uh, Mr. Rutherford's comments about staff? Would that be okay? Yes. Thank you. I wasn't not sure if that's even appropriate or not, but mm-hmm. I thought seeing as Mr. Rutherford brought it up, it might be okay for me to respond as Chief yep. Executive. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you um, for acknowledging um, the impact on some of the social media and staff. So as first up on behalf of staff, I think it's really important to acknowledge and express that thanks. Um, in terms of just to give councillors um, some comfort around um, how I work with staff. I encourage staff not to um, necessarily look at the social media, um, and particularly it can be very negative and it can be very personalised. And we have supports in place for staff in terms of access to um, uh, EAP services or um, et cetera. And we encourage staff to, um, if they want to look at social media, to look at the positive aspects of social media that gives them either some personal or, or family pleasure and gain, as opposed to focusing on the, the negative. Um, and also made a commitment to staff too that where there is fake news or misinformation, we will always endeavour to come out and clarify with fact. But what we are, um, I'm very clear as a CEO, I'm not going to get into a tit for tat on social media or play out responses in media around giving um, airtime um, because that is not beneficial either. So I just want to give you the certainty that there is significant support there for staff and the wraparound, but thank you for the acknowledgement of some of the very personalised attacks that are taking place currently. Just while we're on that, is EAP available for elected members? Uh, or are we, we on we, our own in terms of what no, we no, read on social media? We, we would always make it available. So to, um, if an elected member felt the need for some support is to please pick up the phone and give me a call, it is a confidential service. Too late. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, we've done that, that, that over the last two years. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I knew at the time we were being up and had our nice label to tell you about that. Yeah. Does he need it? Um, it's good to do something positive, eh? Yeah. It's a little bit of a shift going on at the moment. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Um, I will take this up. Uh, this. Um, two things that have come up out of that, given that a number of you are stepping down. Uh, at our last meeting, it is my intention to uh, to give anyone who's stepping down an opportunity for a, um, what if, a valedictory um, address, given the length of time some of you have, um, have served. Uh, so again, just some forewarning, that opportunity will be there if anyone wants to. Um, <laughs> to well, I guess there's an opportunity to make something positive or negative or round it out. Um, so that's that's coming. Um, okay, so that's public forum. I think we've got enough there. Oh, can I just make a point? Yes, uh, Councillor Rutherford, I am um, applaud the way that uh, put a positive slant on to those who wish to enter the arena. That um, that it is it is a, a great um, activity and a great occupation to be in, and it is very fulfilling. So, um, and now that most of the drama is gone. That should be interesting in the next three years. But it is that's the positive side. Thanks. Okay, so Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to acknowledge too the fact that since my letter went in on Monday, um, I've fielded a number of calls from people who sort of didn't apologize, but they thought that they were in the firing line for the negativity. Uh, and I assured them they weren't. Interesting. Okay, so that's done, public forum's done. Right, we do need, so what I'm gonna do now is we'll move us into public excluded and then we'll break for um, say 10 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll come back and carry on. So there's a recommendation there as agenda item eight to uh, public excluded from the following parts of proceedings of the meeting um, to discuss future solid waste management and item 10, Westport wastewater supply trunk main replacement procurement plan. Uh, I move that way. Seconded, Councillor Hawes. Discussion? Yes. Yes? I'd just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the fact that we do not move the public excluded lightly, but there is always a good reason behind it. And it has been my pleasure over the last um, three years that this has been a, a very limited process, um, only in this necessary times. So I just wanted to make sure that people realise that by seconding this motion, and I'm fully aware of the reasons why I'm looking into it and the need for it. Thank you. And that we release almost everything after it. <laughs> um, hey, all those in favour? Any against? Very unanimously. Okay, we'll have a um, recess for minutes. Come back at five past five, please. <coughs> <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.